Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Aquarium Online Academy. Today, we're going to be talking about animals that are wiggly and squiggly. Are you all wiggly and squiggly? I am. I had a lot of coffee this morning. Okay. Well, we should get started then, shouldn't we? We here at the Aquarium Online Academy love the participation from our viewers. So thank you so much for watching. If you're watching live, you can text us. We have a text number right here on the lower bar right here, 562-286-1838. But if you're not watching live, you can also email us questions at live at lbaop.org. So that way, if you still have questions, even if it was aired after the fact, you can get them answered by our staff here in our education department. So I have Dana helping out control this stuff on the screen. Jen's on question control. Now, if you do texting questions, we may get to all of them. We may not get to all of them. So some Jen will be able to answer and some I'll be able to answer in the studio on the air. Okay, so what makes an animal wiggly and squiggly? It's not just caffeine. It's not just a big piece of cake for lunch. What is that? How, how am I moving right now? My awkward dancing, how does that, how does that happen? We have muscles and bones in our body. So where do we have bones? Can you point on yourself where there's a bone in your body? You can almost point anywhere and there's going to be a bone somewhere underneath your skin. Now the most important one we have that determines a wiggly animal is called our backbone. You can feel it. Can you lean over a little bit, touch your backbone? Our spinal column provides structure and support so we can stand upright and do all the things we need to do, running, walking. Our bones allow us to move in a very specific way because the muscles are attached to the bones. So if the muscles are pulling on your arm, your arm goes up. And if the muscles over here pull on your arm, the arm goes down. So our muscles connected to our bones help us move. But there's animals that don't have bones, aren't there? Can you think of a few? Hmm. One of my favorite animals to touch here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. We have so many of them in our touch pools. Those are the sea stars. Let's use our sea star as our exemplar wiggly squiggly animal. They don't really look super wiggly though, do they? Maybe they're a little squiggly, but they don't have a backbone. They don't have an internal skeleton either. So how are we describing their bodies? Have you ever touched one before? You might have here or at another zoo or aquarium, or maybe you've even touched one at the beach. I don't know if I would do that, but they have kind of a rough texture to their skin. If you look really close at their skin, it's got this rough, rocky looking texture to it. And they do kind of feel like a, a rough rock. The bat star, this particular one, is a little more rough than other kinds of sea stars. So sea stars range in the texture, how they feel. Some are very smooth, some are very rough, some are very bumpy. But they have a different kind of structure to their body. Do they have bones like we do in our skull or our teeth? Ah, No, they have bony plates in their skin, which is kind of like having armored skin, but they don't have a skeleton on the inside like we do. Well, let's keep thinking. Who else that lives in the ocean either does or does not have a skeleton? We could make some process of elimination here. Hmm. What about dolphins? Do dolphins have skeletons? Yeah, they do. So they count like we do as an animal called a vertebrate, meaning we have vertebra, the bones in our back. Vertebra there's a stack of them all the way down your spine. Maybe you saw one at a doctor's office or a picture of a skeleton before. And all those little cylindrical pieces in the spine, those are the vertebra. Do they have a backbone? No. So we don't call them a vertebrate. We call them an invertebrate, which in our science terminology means no vertebra or no backbone. So we're going to be talking about the invertebrate animals. No backbones today. All right. Dana's going to surprise me with an animal that does not have a backbone. And we're going to see if we can figure out if that's true. Let's use our scientific minds, our powers of observation, our powers to question, and we'll see if we can come up with some conclusions about the things that don't have backbones. All right, Dana, what do you have ready for us? The animals are moving slow today. It's a, it's a, it's a slow Tuesday. All right, she's got one ready for us. Wait. Oh, gosh. Who's in here? What animal is this? That's so cool. See, even our friend the octopus is telling you to text in your questions. Now, how many tentacles does an octopus have? You're right. They have eight. 
Now, octo in science means eight. So it's like an octagon has eight sides, like the sides of a stop sign has eight sides. Octagon, octopus has eight legs. Now, in the funny thing in some of our science terminology is that some words, here's a baby octopus. <laughs> the baby octopus looks just like the adults. Uh, in our science terminology, we use these different terms to mean different things. Remember, invertebrate means no backbone. Octo means eight. So octopus, when we try to say like lots of them, octopuses, or octopods, or octopi, they're technically all correct. They're, because of how we would, what's called conjugate, or change a, a singular term to a plural term, like cow versus cows, okay? Octopus versus octopuses, or octopi, or octopods, they kind of all technically count. So there's not one rule for that word, but there's other words in science that, yeah, we have to change how we spell the word so it counts as a plurality, or a group of that same organism. Like, uh, what's, a, what's the multiple of goose? Not gooses, it's geese, yeah. So we sometimes have to change the spelling to reflect what it actually is. So my friend Luke says there's only one right answer. I, I contest that there's more than one answer. All right, Gage is asking, welcome back, Gage. Can you find sea stars in the kelp forest? Yes, we can. Now this is a kelp forest habitat. Even though there's no kelp in here, all these things live in our kelp forests of California. Do you see any sea stars in here, Gage? Ooh, there's one there, there's one there. Oh, there's a sneaky one way over there. Here's a real kelp forest habitat in the Aquarium of the Pacific. This is our amber forest habitat. Here's our giant kelp right here. Can you see? Where's the sea star? Oh, right over there. That sea star back in the corner. Yeah, that's actually a live sea star too. We have real sea stars in amber forest. They're not decorative sea stars. These are actual stars and fish, but the kelp is a replica. And that's because kelp is not as easy to grow inside our spaces in the Aquarium of the Pacific. But that's okay. The rest of the fish and the sea stars don't mind. Oh, there's also a sea star right there. So sea stars do live in most of the main habitats around the world. Kelp forests, deep sea habitats, coral reefs. I don't know if there's any freshwater sea stars. Because they, I mean, if they're a sea star, they should live in the, the sea, right? The ocean. Okay. So I don't know if there's any freshwater stars. But the stars that are in the ocean, they live across a large range of habitats. There's even Arctic and Antarctic sea stars. That's so cool. All right. Um, is, several of you have asked, do the fish have bones? Well, here's my fish model. Does this look like this has bones in it? It does. These are fish bones. And these are, this is a plastic model of, I think... A perch, or maybe a... Mm, it's not a mackerel. It doesn't have the right kind of fins. Um, but it does have bones in their body. And here's their skull. They have a backbone that goes down their back. They have ribs, just like we do. You have ribs right here. And this is the skeletal model of a fish. So fish do. Now, the interesting thing is that most animals on the planet don't count as, an, as a vertebrate. Over 90% of all the living things that have been discovered... Actually, it's almost like 98% of all living things that have been discovered don't have a backbone. But we think of animals mostly that, that do have backbones, because on land, it's a little more necessary to be able to do all the things that we need to do. Find food, dance, walk around, get, get to water. So we need skeletons a little bit more if we're bigger animals than if we're smaller animals. So think of some small animals on land that don't have backbones. Bugs, they don't have backbones, good. They have an exoskeleton, so their skeleton is not on the inside like ours, it's on the outside. But they still don't have a backbone. Some of these animals that would live in a kelp forest are the same way. They have an exoskeleton, a shell on the outside, but no backbone. All right, Lily asked, do sea animals with no bones glow? Well, great job, Lily, because there are some that do. Some animals glow, some animals don't. Now, I think in Dana's collection, there's a flower hat jelly picture right in front of her, that maybe we can get the flower hat picture. So some animals do glow, some animals don't. It's actually a special adaptation to be able to glow. Not all things get to glow. This is the flower hat jelly. Now it doesn't glow like this all the time. We have to shine a special light on it so that it does glow. But there's others that do something called bioluminescence or bioluminesce. So that means they can glow because of their bodies glowing. There's bacteria or other chemicals that are made in their body 
that are just like the glow sticks we buy at like the holidays or maybe for an emergency kit in your car and you, you crack it you shake it up and it glows a special color that's a chemical reaction just like mixing baking soda and vinegar is a chemical reaction so once the chemicals are used there's no more light so they if they have the ability to bioluminesce those chemicals are constantly made so they can keep glowing like lightning bugs they can glow whenever they need to because the chemicals are constantly made but other things like we can't glow like that we don't have the ability to make that product in our body so we can't glow all right pippa's asking why do sea stars live in rocks let's go back to looking at some sea stars on the rocks and let's talk about their bodies so jellies can swim bloop, bloop. Yep. do do sea stars swim what do you think are any of these stars going to just like fly off the rock and bloop, 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 start swimming around? I have not seen that yet. Now, some stars, when they have the ability to fall off of things, they kind of look like they're falling gracefully. But when they're juveniles, when they're really little tiny babies, they do float in the water. But they're not really swimming where they want to go. They're plankton. They move wherever the ocean pushes them. So the plankton will I'll let them float wherever. They land on a rock somewhere and they start growing up into their adult body like this one. But they are going to walk around. Now you can't, actually you can, can, you can kind of see over here. There's little feet on the bottom of a sea star. So they don't pick up their feet like, like this. They have little tiny two feet on the bottom of their body down each channel or row of their arms. And they just kind of look like they're gliding across the surface. Have you seen my sea star impersonation before? Okay, here it is. See, stars don't walk very fast, so it's just kind of happening real slowly like this. And maybe they go back the other way. Oh, no. I look just like that one! <laughs> the resemblance is uncanny. <gasps> Take a look at this sea star! There's the little feet that are on the underside of their body. Now, this one's sticking to the window, so it's not flying or swimming through the water. It's on the window of the exhibit, and... These little feet can suction and stick onto surfaces of any texture, and that's how they walk around. So great question, Peppa. They, they have to live on the rocks because they, they have to walk on the rocks. It's just like we don't fly without airplanes, so we don't live up in the sky unless we get up there with machines or our legs or what have you. We have to walk up there. So sea stars have to be on the ground because that's where they are walking. Michaela's asking, what happens if a star... <laughs> if a star or an octopus, there was a couple words missing in that question. If a star or an octopus loses a leg or a tentacle, that's a great question. In the animal world, animals have the most amazing adaptations. We have a lot of amazing adaptations too. Do we have something that this sea star does not have? I mean, besides a backbone. <sighs> we have lungs. So we can process a lot of air through our lungs to get oxygen. Our bodies can do so many amazing things. Our hearts are very special and very de and designed very well for how our body needs to move oxygen around our body. Their bodies might seem like it's even better because they can breathe through their skin. They don't have to have lungs, but they don't have certain abilities that we have, and we don't have abilities that they do. So they can regrow an entire limb or arm if it's gone. An octopus can do the same thing. So if I accidentally lost a finger, I can't grow it back. I would have to have it reattached or I would just not have it anymore. If I cut my skin like a paper cut, our skin can grow back together. But if we lose large portions of ourselves, we can't grow that part back. But sea stars and octopus can. Now, it's not true that if you were to just like divide it down the middle, you get two sea stars. They grow into two full sea stars. That doesn't quite work out because in the middle right here is their stomach. Now, there's copies of all of their their guts, their inside organs, inside each arm. So if they lost one, there's four more of those that can do that job. But if they got cut through the middle and their stomach were split open, well, then they can't eat. So as long as the middle disc is okay, they can keep going. They might grow back two or three arms at a time, or four, actually. It just depends on the sea star. Okay, Alex asked, do the octopus sting? Good question, Alex. We know a lot of animals in the ocean sting, and those with tentacles like an anemone or a jelly do sting. So tentacle doesn't necessarily mean it stings you. Their tentacles are to hold on to 
things. They have suction cups. It's like us having arms and fingers. The suction cups are like their little fingers. They can control each suction cup separately from each other, and that's so they can walk around, move around, and in some cases, for, for some smaller octopus species, they can swim a little bit too. So their tentacles are for moving and grabbing, not for stinging. Now, interestingly, all of the cephalopods that I know of, at least all the octopuses, have a venomous bite. Yeah. So when we hear about like octopus being dangerous to people, like the blue ringed octopus is the most venomous. Well, how does that get to you? Well, they have to bite you. So it's not by touching their skin, like the, some of the poisonous frogs where you, the the, if you touch them, you have to kind of ingest it a little bit, rub it in your eyes or put your fingers in your mouth. Never do that after you touch things in nature. The octopus would have to bite you just like a snake has to bite you to inject the venom, except for those spitting snakes. That's an exception to the rule. All right, so the octopus has to bite you to inject the venom. So those that are really dangerous to people, it, they had bitten them, injected the venom, and that's where they got sick from. A lot of them, it's not super dangerous to people, but it still will hurt and will create a lot of pain if they do bite you. Now, can you find the octopus in this picture? Huh. Where? Where's that octopus at? Oh, is this its eye right here? No? Well, I man, that kind of looks like an eye. Oh, there's an eye up here. Well, what's the difference between these two? Well, this one is the correct or actual eye. This is an eye spot. So that is a fake spot that, or fake eye that it could look like an eye. So if I were a predator and I was like, ooh, I'm going to grab this thing and I go for the eyes or where their head would be, I would grab the wrong part. Their eyes are up here. And this part in the back where it looks like it's just their head sticking way out the back of their, their skull, which they don't have when they're an invertebrate, this is actually like their tummy. So if you were to be, an, if you wanted to be an octopus, here's how you'd have to do this. All right, so we have our, our mouth, our head, our, all of our organs. <clears throat> Excuse me. We would have to take all of our arms and legs off of where they're at and then glue them to our face around our mouth. And now you're an octopus. It's not an option arts and crafts I would suggest you do right now. But when you look at their bodies, the head is just this middle part. Their brain's in there. Their mouth is about right here, but it's in between all the tentacles. And then they have all these tentacles. So I have a little octopus model we're going to use to help explain this, since our camouflaging hiding friend is making it tough for some of us. All right, so here's my octopus friend. Hello. Hello. So the eyes and the head are just in the middle. The mouth would be between all of the tentacles. Here's their tentacles. So these are like arms and legs to us, right? And then this part is where all of the stomach and gills and guts and body parts are at. So it looks like it's their head, but it's more like this part of us. That's really cool. Their body has adapted to change the orientation of all the different parts of their body so it, it can operate and move around their environment really well. So much so that they can escape or hide into the tiniest of spaces. They can fit into whatever their mouth can fit into. So their mouth is the only hard part. They have a beak-like hard structure to their mouth. Actually, I think I have... I can't see it. We, we did have a... Oh, no, I do have a beak. Hold on. I'm going to put it under our camera over here. So Dana's going to help turn that on. I'll be right back. All right. We have a beak from a, this is a, I think a plastic model of a Humboldt squid. And it's a pretty big one. So the Humboldt squid can get about my size, right? So Humboldt squid is about the size of a person. And if their mouth is this big, that can take some pretty big bites, but, you know, it's not as big as our mouth. Well, what if you're a little octopus like our octopus model? Their mouth would be very, very small, comparatively. And as long as their mouth can fit through a space, like a crack in the, in the rocks or even a plumbing pipe, their whole body can smoosh through it. Could you imagine playing hide-and-seek if your whole body could smoosh through the cracks and crevices? Ultimate hide and seek so on this one, it's probably about the size of, of their eye. That's how big their mouth would be. So that's pretty cool that an octopus has that ability, that it can grow back tentacles, it can camouflage really well. We saw that. And then they can smoosh through the tiniest of spaces. They have, they have the suction cups on their tentacles that they can use too. So an octopus and squid are cousins, but they have very similar adaptations, very similar abilities to survive. 
Well, all right. We talked about some stars. We talked about the jellies briefly. We talked about an octopus. Are there any other squishy invertebrate animals you want to talk about? Well, maybe not squishy ones, but we should probably talk about the ones with the claws. They're not so scary. Don't worry. The claws and the mouth parts may look a little different, but oh, who's this? Stay. No, it's not live. This is a molt of a lobster. So when they molt, they shed the outer layer of their exoskeleton, their shell, and they pull themselves out, and then they can harden their new shell and grow bigger. So animals like this one called arthropods, they will molt or shed that outer layer, sometimes very frequently in a year if they're very young. So if they're younger ones, that, that can happen. They, can, they have to grow, so they have to shed their exoskeleton. Well, when they start to grow up and they're big adults, they don't molt nearly as often. It's because they don't grow as much. Just like us. We don't, we're not really growing taller here as adults. Might grow a little bit outside, but we're trying to prevent that. So we, don't, we wouldn't have the same effect. It's kind of like when we were kids and we grew up, we had to get a new pair of pants or shorts or t-shirts every so often because we outgrew them. Well, it's kind of like these animals. They outgrow the exoskeleton that they have and they have to shed the outermost layer so they can keep growing and getting bigger. Now, this is not as big as this animal can get either. Here's a really cool picture of a crab, a red crab, that I believe is, this is coral, so this must be a tropical crab. And it does the same thing. It will molt every so often. Now, these lobsters, these uh, spiny lobsters that live in California, they can get, I think, just the body itself without antenna length is like this long. They get huge. That crab is probably about this big. I can't tell from that picture. It looks huge in the picture. But different arthropods get to different sizes. So think of the, the bug-like animals in, on land. So we have insects on land. We get some pretty big insects on land, don't we? But in the ocean, they're basically the insects, but for the water. So crustaceans are like the insects of the sea. Lobsters, crabs, shrimp. They kind of look like a bug. I don't know if they taste like a bug, but they do, they do taste good. But they live in a very wet habitat. They need the water because their gills or their ability to breathe, they're not quite gills like a fish, but their ability to breathe requires lots of water around their body. Now, there's some that live on land that are crustaceans like the pill bugs or roly-polies. And they still have to be in a wet habitat. Even if it's, I mean, I grew up in Colorado where it's kind of dry. We'd still find them in the garden because that's the, where it's wetter. And as long as they had a wet area that they could exchange oxygen into their, into their, uh, basically their gills, they could still breathe and survive. All right, we have a little bit of a video we can show you about the lobsters. Let's take a look at some lobster footage real quick. Oh, so Danny said there may not be a lobster in it, but this is where they live. Now, if if you have any eagle eyes that you can zone in on some lobsters, text in to Jen and let her know. While we're spying for lobsters, I'm going to step out real quick. Joaquin is asking, why do jellies have stingers? Good question, Joaquin. Why should an animal have stinging abilities? Do you think the jellies are trying to be mean and be like, and I stung you, and I stung you? No. The jellies need them to capture their food. So the jellies need stinging cells to capture their food so they can eat or to help defend themselves. So in some cases, they're defending their bodies by being able to sting things around them. Adara is asking, how many squiggly fish are there? Well, guess what, Adara? There are, I think, in the entire world, freshwater, saltwater, everywhere, I think there's maybe 28,000 species of fish. I could be wrong on the number, but it's, it's less than we would think for species of fish. There's a lot of varieties of fish, and there's a lot of kinds of fish, too. So there's the fish like we think of. There's like frogfish, mola molas. Sharks are types of fish. Stingrays are fish. Uh, man, there's so many sp species of fish. Hagfish, actually a fish. Eels are fish. There's so many kinds of fish. There's a lot. Now, since they have a backbone, do we remember first thing we talked about? Are they a vertebrate or invertebrate? They're a vertebrate because they have a backbone. Good job. All right, Junie from Queens. Junie, I think you've been watching before. Welcome back to the Aquarium Online Academy. Our octopus and squid cousins, yeah, they all belong to a group called the cephalopods. So remember we told you about how to make yourself into an octopus? You got to put all your arms and legs in your face? Well, ceph, C-E-P-H, how you would spell cephalopod, 
That refers to the head. So here's a cuttlefish, also a cousin to the octopus and the squid. Their legs, or podia, are attached to their head also. And then back here, this is like the abdomen. This is the where all the guts and the, the like the belly material is at, right? So those are related. Now there's another cephalopod out there called a nautilus. The nautilus is the only one of the cephalopod group still alive that still has a shell. We think some octopods or cuttlefish or squid, maybe in the ancient, way before dinosaur times, maybe they had shells, maybe they didn't, maybe these developed without shells completely. So science is trying to figure out uh, their family relationships, like who's most related to whom, and what do they all look like back in the days of yore. I don't know what, that's a long time ago. Back, way back in the geologic uh, record, millions and millions and almost a billion years ago almost. Uh, what did they look like? What, what did they develop into? How did they change over time? So there's a lot of cool information about cephalopods and their ancient relatives, if you ever want to check that out. Our cuttlefish cuddly. Our cuddlefish cuddly. No, not so much. No. <laughs> Sadly, no. We're going to show you why they're not so cuddly. So here's a cuttlefish. Oh, a little shrimpy. Wait, oh my god! That's nature. <laughs> cuttlefish gotta eat. They might be cuddly to other cuttlefish, but I mean, they're social. They do interact and talk to each other through the light shows that they do. They do interact and communicate. But I don't know if I'd want to cuddle with one. Remember, their cousin the squid has a venomous bite. I don't know about them if they're gonna be painful to hang out with too. Cuttlefish do get pretty big though. There's a couple species of giant cuttlefish that are about this size, but most of them are kind of small. So, I mean, they're uh, stuffed animal cuttlefish would be your best bet to cuddle with. That actually would be pretty cute. Uh, did fish or invertebrates appear first? That is an interesting question. What do you think is a more complex or more difficult structure for nature to come up with? Bones or no bones? Ooh no bones so if we look way back into the geologic history so if we pretend this is now okay we got like there's dinosaurs other things like fish and sharks and even before them there are all the really squishy weird animals that lived after something called the cambrian explosion it's not a boom it was actually uh in a period of time where there's a lot of life developing on the planet and even before the cambrian explosion there were a lot of life forms that did not have backbones even skeletons kind of developed in a different way than we think of so sharks and rays have been around a very long time way before dinosaurs and they have a skeleton but not like ours see this wiggly part in our nose this part right here that's cartilage sharks and rays have a cartilage skeleton which kind of happened first before heavy bony skeletons did too so even skeletons have have developed over time in different ways and in different kinds of organisms birds have a different skeleton than we do their skeleton is lightweight so that they can fly. Well, not all birds, but many of the birds have a lightweight skeleton to allow them to fly. That's really cool. All right, do any land animals have no bones? Yeah, they do. Or I guess, yeah, they don't. Well, I don't know. There's a lot of animals that live on land that don't have a backbone. Think of all the bugs, the worms. Hmm. Like all the things that we might think of as like the monsters in our backyard. Those don't have a backbone. So birds, mammals, uh, fish, they have backbones. So all those other moving animals on land, they, that they don't have, they don't belong to like the big things we think of as animals. They don't have a backbone and they count as an animal. Great job, everybody. Uh, Eliana's asking, do eels have backbones? Quick review. Eels are fish. So do they have a backbone? Since eels count as fish, what do you think? Yeah, they have a backbone. Good job. Uh, any words on the Kraken? <laughs> One word, I love them. So if you think of the history of maritime or oceanic or uh, aquatic travel, and on the maps, they would draw like these rawr, scary monsters. Who knows if they just drew that thing there because they didn't want people to drive their boat through it. Maybe it was actually a gnarly place to try and drive through, so you wouldn't want to drive through the middle of a giant cracker, so you just avoid that space. Well, there's also tales and stories of monster animals attacking people. Remember the picture of the Humboldt squid? It's a huge squid, 
and they do attack people. Uh, so don't go swimming with them like this person, unless you're a uh, extra super duper professional. Because when a Humboldt squid get aggressive, they could hurt people. So maybe the story of the Humboldt squid was, you know, taken from somebody, or the Kraken was taken from somebody interacting with a Humboldt, and then they just told the story over, and everybody told the stories, and the story got bigger and stranger and more interesting over time, and so they created the idea of a monster that's uh, a couple hundred feet long. Now, there is a giant squid that gets, I think, 60-plus feet long in total, but they don't really hang out with boats. They're not trying to sink ships. Ah, okay. Now, they're eating stuff in the way deep of the ocean. They are deep, deep ocean animals. Sperm whales will hunt them, but they have to go way down to find them. They have to dive 6,000 feet or more to find giant squid sometimes. So that's my, that's my take on the Kraken. Cool animals, but probably more of a folklore or a story of animals that were based off of real things. But that's kind of cool. We, we create stories to engage our imaginations and to, and to create cool stuff uh, based off of actual animals that live in the ocean. Susie, five years old. Thank you so much. I think that was Susie. That was saying how much they appreciate watching our programs and how much we have fun. We love to have fun here. We're going to have a lot of fun today. There's a lot more programming we're going to talk about. The next program that we're going to have is about Earth. Discover Earth. We're going to use a special tool to show off how we can look at the whole planet at once. Stay tuned because it's really, really fun. We're also going to be talking about fish this afternoon, uh, deep sea stuff, and then more plankton from Jen. Jen loves plankton. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. We're out of time, so if you have more questions, email them to live at lbaop.org, and then we'll make sure that we can answer those for you. So remember, if you're not watching live, email us at the email at the bottom. And thanks, everybody. Enjoy your Tuesday afternoon.